Hi, I'm Mark Lutz. I'm the Growth and Healing Pastor and the Director of Life Reset Ministry at the Vineyard. Uh, you might notice that in conversations when you greet people today and you ask, how are you doing? You often get a qualified response like, well, kind of, sort of, I guess I'm okay. Uh, I've been saying I'm COVID okay, that it seems ingenuine to say that I'm fine in light of everything that's going on. But when you factor in COVID, I guess I'm all right. And most people kind of get that. A lot of times I'll hear people say, I think I might be depressed. And I think the tentative nature of that is that we've never been through this before, so we don't know what a normal reaction to pandemic and uh, social upheaval is, and, and when I've maybe crossed over into something that is more dangerous, like a, a depression. Well, I think it's a, a question that has a, it's a trick question, has the answer is a trick answer, that being depressed could be a normal reaction to what it is that we're all going through. And so uh, I thought it'd be worth talking about uh, what is the difference between feeling depressed feelings and being in a depression, that it might give, uh, give us some clarity and a little bit of comfort to know where we are and to have a little bit of an idea uh, what we can do to get to a better place, to get the feeling better. So let's first, let's talk about uh, how would you know if you're feeling depressed feelings or if you are depressed, if you're in a state of depression. And uh, I think of it as, as like a, a big swimming pool full of sadness. And if you're feeling depressed feelings, it's, it's as though you're in the shallow end of the swimming pool, right? So with a little bit of effort, you can kind of get your way to the side of the pool and you get your hands on the edge of the pool deck and your feet are on the bottom so you can push off. And with a little bit of effort, you can get up out of the, the pool of sadness. Now, if you're in a depression, if you are depressed, it'd be like if you're standing on the bottom of the pool in the deep end. And so like even just pushing off the bottom isn't enough to get you even to the top. So you have to kick and claw and you finally break free to the surface, but then you gotta get to the side of the pool and yeah, you can get your, your hands on the pool deck, but your feet can't touch the bottom, so you can't push off, so you're really struggling to get out. And it's, it's really helpful if there's someone already out who can lend you a hand and help pull you out. So feeling depressed feelings, shallow end, it's uh, uh, intense sadness, but it tends to not last a long time, like not months. And uh, usually it's clearly linked to uh, an identifiable cause. You know what the source of it is. And when it's feeling depressed feelings, they often improve when the circumstances improve. Uh, but being in a depression, uh, sometimes you can't link it to what the, exactly the cause is. And uh, it lasts longer. And uh, in fact, psychologists, they have a, a tool, the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual, where they identify what makes a depression. And so here's the things uh, that they're looking for. In a depression, you have four of these traits uh, for two weeks or longer. And there are a change in appetite. Now, and it, it can be either direction, that you have no appetite and so you're losing weight, or that you're eating comfort food a lot and you're gaining weight. Uh, so either one of those could be a clue. Uh, secondly, um, decreased uh, energy and motivation. Uh, it feels like uh, you're wearing lead clothes, like you can barely move. It takes effort to do anything. Uh, Inability to do activities of daily living, schoolwork, hygiene, those kind of things get harder. Um, change in your sleep patterns. It, it could be the, uh, like the eating, like you can't get sleep, you have insomnia. Or it could be you're sleeping all the time. It could be that you're sleeping the same number of hours, but when you're sleeping has shifted. Like you can't get to sleep until 2 or 3 in the morning, and then you sleep till noon. It's maybe close to 8 hours sleep, but it's, it's shifted on you. Difficulty thinking, concentrating, loss of pleasure, things that you used to find joy in, don't, you, you can't feel that joy anymore. Uh, feelings of worthlessness, helplessness, uh, thoughts that uh, the, the only way to end this would be to end your life. And so if you have four of those things lasting two weeks or longer, uh, a counselor would say there's, there's a good indication that you could be in a state of depression. Now, if you think about it, uh, could a quarantine put us into a depression? 
If you think about those traits and you think about what happens in a quarantine, there's a pretty good uh, connection there. Impaired social functioning. Well, that's the whole point of a quarantine, to reduce the amount of interaction with other people. Uh, physical activity reduced. There's nowhere to go and nothing to do. Uh, change in sleep patterns. If you don't have to get up early in the morning, then you tend not to and you stay up later. Um, decreased motivation. It's like, well, what's the point of doing anything? Because we're all locked up in our houses anyhow. Feeling helpless? Yeah, in the face of a worldwide pandemic and social unrest, what can I, from my uh, living room, do about those things? Uh, and struggling with activities of daily living, specifically getting out of your sweatpants and taking a shower. Yeah, a quarantine makes all these things harder. So you recognize a quarantine does push us in that direction towards feeling depressed or being in a depression. So uh, that's, that's what the beginning of it is. Uh, how does a depression start and what sustains us? Let's talk about that a little bit more. And there's three factors typically that will get us stuck in a depression. That's, that's more than just feeling depressed feelings. Uh, three things, a loss or, or multiple losses, um, unmet needs, wants, and expectations, and then insufficient coping skills. So we'll talk about each of those. Uh, losses, that can be a uh, loss of relationship, could be a loss through death, could be lost through a breakup, uh, a parents divorce, friends move away, it could be loss of uh, uh, a job. And in, in, in the COVID-19, that's certainly been losses. People have lost businesses. They've lost jobs. They've lost, lost incomes, lost ability to socialize with their friends. Those kind of losses naturally generate sad feelings. And so that's the, often the beginning of it. But losses alone typically don't cause a depression. It's losses and one of the other things. So the other things are unmet needs. We all have valid needs, things that we have to have in order to thrive. So that's, uh, we all are built for a relationship. We're not built to be uh, alone. So we, we need relationship, we need love and affection, we need respect and affirmation, we need nurture and attention, we need safety and protection. These are all things that if we need and we don't get them, uh, we suffer. We also have wants, and maybe they're not as essential as needs, but they're still fairly important, and they're fairly universal among all of us. So uh, wants that are common to us, success. We want to accomplish something that's noteworthy. Status. Uh, we want to be recognized, esteemed by somebody. Power. We want to have agency to decide and to act in our own lives and within a certain sphere of influence. Productivity. We want to produce something to the common good and trust. We want to be able to uh, trust, uh, have the trust of people, and have people that we can trust. So these, these are wants that are pretty common. And then from our needs and from our wants, we often build expectations. And the expectations can be realistic, but not always, sometimes not so much. Uh, but if they aren't met, they contribute towards the depression. So expectations could be things like, uh, I want to be liked by everybody. Uh, expectation that I can never fail, an expectation that life must always be fair. That one really get rattled in a, a pandemic. Expectation that I'm entitled to, and then you fill in the blank, whatever's important to you. That could be, uh, I'm entitled to pain-free living. I'm entitled to certain material things, a, a certain standard of living. So these expectations, the wants and needs, if they aren't met over a period of time, they add to losses, then that strengthens uh, sadness, sorrow that we experience. And then the thing that can just lock it in is insufficient coping skills for how to manage this. I think, I don't always say all or none, but I would say almost no one is born with all the life skills you need to be successful doing life. I, I would imagine almost all of us need uh, someone to teach us these things, to impart those things to us. And uh, the reality is uh, none of us had perfect parents, mentors, teachers. Uh, they, uh, even in the best of situations, parents did the best they could, but they maybe didn't have everything themselves. So if they didn't have a skill, they couldn't pass it on to you. So it's likely that uh, good, uh, intelligent people might not possess all the necessary coping skills for handling uh, large crises. And so if you get those three things together, 
uh, loss, unmet wants and needs, uh, insufficient coping skills, uh, it really has a chance to lock in a depression. And it, it can be so if it's, uh, the impact is huge all at once, but it can also be if the impacts are smaller, but they drag on for a longer period of time, that eventually they get in long enough and it can lock in a depression. So uh, who, who could be depressed? Anybody, everybody, because uh, everybody experiences losses. Uh, everybody has unmet needs and wants living in a fallen world, and hardly anyone has all the skills necessary for managing things. So uh, if it turns out that you would, you would do a self-analysis and you'd say, I, I think I'm depressed, there's no shame in that. Because typically it's not your fault. It's, depression comes from things outside of us. So it's not your fault. However, it's your responsibility. Now that you're aware of this, it's your sp uh, responsibility to do something about it because it's your life. And uh, there's certain things that just they fall to you to do. It's your responsibility that it's your life. And this would be one of those. So uh, figuring out if you, if you think maybe I'm just having depressed feelings or I'm in a depression, either way, the, the next thing that you think about is, so what do you do about it? What is it that helps when, if you're in a depression or you're feeling depressed things? And I want to just go ahead and call out the question behind the question for most uh, Christians, most people of faith. And that question behind the question is, why can't I just pray depression away? Why can't I just pray and God uh, make it go away? Um, and I'm not saying that it couldn't happen. I'm not saying that it hasn't happened. not saying that it wouldn't happen in the future. But most times, uh, I don't see the miracle of a prayer and the depression goes away. What I usually see is a process. And, uh, and the reason that prayer alone, if, if that's all you're doing is praying, the reason that you might stay stuck in a depression for a while, it, it comes down to the nature of prayer and the nature of people. So the nature of prayer is that uh, prayer is not an incantation to obligate God to do certain things. It's not casting a Christian spell, doing Christian magic. It's not rubbing the genie's lamp to get three wishes. That's not what prayer is. Prayer is the way that we engage in a partnership with God. And in this partnership, there's things that God does, there's things that we do. Uh, and the way that partnership works, there are things, some things that only God can do for us. And human nature is such that it's, it's bizarre, but we often gra gravitate to, I'm going to try to do those things. I can do it myself. I'll do the things that only God can do. Then there are things that are our responsibility to do. And human nature is such that for some strange reason, we have an aversion to doing the things that are our responsibility to do. We'll try to get other people to do, pray, talk God into doing what is our part. Uh, and it never happens. And then the third part is when we do our part in the partnership, God adds power to our part. It's like the difference between flying into a headwind or flying with a tailwind. You know, going from east coast to west coast, west coast to east coast, those flights take different amounts of time, even though it's the same distance. Because one way you're going into a headwind, the other way you're going with a tailwind. So when we align ourselves with God, we do our parts of the partnership. He adds power, and it accomplishes more than it really ought to just based on what it is we're doing. In prayer, uh, it's reasonable to, to pray and ask for clarification. What is my part? God, what's the thing that I can do? It's reasonable to ask for uh, strength and courage to do my part. But I think it's wasted breath to use prayer to try to convince God into doing my part for me. Uh, he's just incredibly patient, infinitely patient, uh, and I, I just have never won any of those battles. So uh, we use prayer in the way God intends it and even adjust our expectations about what prayer is going to accomplish uh, and maybe adjust our expectations that they're out there somewhere there's a magic answer that if only I could find it, it would make all the hard things go away. And instead, come to terms with, this is probably going to be a process. And, uh, and realize it's, it's a process not because God is being mean to us or he's withholding good stuff from us. It's just that we and God often have different priorities. Uh, my pro priority is the end result, that I'm happier than I am now. 
God's priority is often the together. He values being together with us. And we're together when we're tackling the adventures of life, when we're solving hard things. We're doing this stuff. It results in the together. And I think that's as important or more important to God sometimes than the final destination of my sadness ends and I'm happy again. Uh, I think God wants us to be happy. He just knows that we're not going to have lasting happiness in any solution we come up with that doesn't include him. So uh, we just understand the nature of prayer. And then secondly, understanding the nature of people. Um, you think of a person, a person is a whole, a whole person. But the person has different aspects to them. We have different parts to us. There's our, our physical, there's our intellectual, there's our uh, emotional, there's our volitional, our free will, our choice, and, uh, and our spiritual. And, and uh, these parts are not so much like individual compartments, uh, like in a toolbox or a, a sewing box or a tackle box, but these various parts are interwoven. And I, and I would even say the spiritual part is all-encompassing of all those parts. So if we're affected in one area, it affects us in the other. And, and you recognize that. If, if you're physically sick for an extended period of time, your mood starts to get darkened. And if your mood is sour for an extended period of time, it can take a toll on relationships. Uh, if, if you've ever had a relationship where you knew you're going to have to have a hard conversation, you're going to have to confront someone, didn't you get that knot in your stomach? Yeah, so the, the relational affects the physical affects the emotional affects it all. It's all together. And so prayer can be really good for getting that uh, instruction on what our part is, strength to do it. But then in all these other facets of our being, there are things that are our part of the partnership. And so I want to talk about those because these are the things that we can do that can help. Uh, if, if we're feeling depressed feelings or in a depression. These are the things that we do, are part of the partnership, and then it invites God to come and add his power to it. So uh, I'll go through uh, section by section and kind of talk about what our parts of the partnership can be. So uh, starting with the intellectual, but even with the intellectual, I'm going to link intellectual and emotional because there's, there's a tie there. Uh, if you study uh, different counseling models, the cognitive behavioral model, we recognize that things happen, and then we run them through the filter of what we believe. What we believe generates feeling. What we believe and feel will drive our behaviors, our actions. So that the belief and driving the feeling, they're very closely connected. Uh, and it's especially true in a depression, because uh, depression creates negative thinking, and negative thinking feeds depression. So those things come together. Scripture tells us that we are to be transformed by the renewing of our mind. Scripture tells us that we have to take every thought captive. That's a description of our part in the partnership. So we have to choose truth. We have to choose to embrace truth, even if we don't like it, if it's not convenient. We have to choose to cast out lies, even if they feel like old, familiar friends. We believe them forever, and there's a weird comfort in them. We have to be able to let go of them. And we even have to be willing to parse out between partial truth and whole truth. But that's part of the keeping track of the intellectual, the mental part that drives feelings. There's a, a psychologist and an author, a very well-known Martin Seligman. He talks about the three Ps. And really, these are three beliefs that will affect whether you might have depression or be resistant to it. And he says that the three Ps uh, are different be, uh, if you're a pessimist or you're an optimist. So the first one is um, pervasive. For a pessimist, if they have a problem, then it's pervasive. If one part of their life is horrible, then it ruins their whole life. There's nothing good in their life. But for an optimist, an optimist can say, yes, it's true, I have a part of my life that's going really hard. But an optimist can also recognize and embrace and celebrate, but this part is going really well. So pervasive is one thing. Personal, uh, the belief for a pessimist, the belief is that my problems happen because of me. They come from within my person because of some 
deficiency of personhood, some uh, flaw that I have. I'm uniquely flawed, worse than all other people, and that's why I have problems. For an optimist, uh, they see the problems as coming from outside of their person. And uh, problems happen to everybody, not just me. And I, as a person, have an ability to work on and resolve problems, especially if I get help. And then uh, permanent. So for a pessimist, they would say, oh, yeah, this, my life is hard, and come to think of it, it's always been hard, and it's going to be hard tomorrow, and it's going to be this way forever. It's just going to be hard. An optimist, uh, their motto is, this too shall pass. And an optimist will remember t problems they had, that the, they did get to some kind of closure, and things did get better once again. So three Ps, those are three beliefs, uh, examples of beliefs, and you can see uh, how those beliefs drive emotion. Now let's talk about motion, pure and simple, a little bit. In that area, what are things that are our part of the partnership? Uh, things that we have, fall to us to do are we have to grieve losses and we have to express sadness. Uh, and neither of those are things that we like doing, want to do, we resist, we fight them, we try to do anything but that. Uh, we try to just move on. Well, the problem is when we don't do those things, they don't go away. They just accumulate, they build up, and they follow us, and they impact our ongoing living. So we have to figure out how to uh, grieve losses, how to express sadness. We have to figure out how to express sadness to people without putting it on them to solve this, to fix this. Uh, most losses are not solved, they're simply processed. Uh, the deal is there are some things that you will lose that you will never get back. And there are some losses that will leave you such that you will never be the same as you were before the loss. However, after a loss, things can be good again. And many people find that on the other side of a loss, their life is strangely richer and deeper, that so somehow their life is enhanced for having gone through that. So we just have to learn how to do that grieving, feeling sadness, expressing that. Um, we might have to clean up the past. As I said, if we have ignored things, it just accumulates, and then it intrudes upon our present. Uh, if we've carried a history of past hurts, anything in our present that reminds us of that sort of uncorks the bottle, and all the pain of the past comes flooding into the present. So uh, finding someone to help us, a counselor can be really helpful in unpacking that baggage, getting it cleaned out, so we're not dragging around extra stuff that uh, is intruding on our present. And then the third thing is uh, maybe not just settling for eliminating the sorrow. Uh, again, Martin, Martin Seligman uh, came up with, a, um, a, he calls a new kind of psychology, he calls it positive psychology. He would say that traditional psychology is good but doesn't go far enough. Traditional psychology is about eliminating misery. But he says that uh, in traditional psychology, that effect usually isn't lasting. Uh, there's often a relapse. So what he's done is said, yeah, let's eliminate uh, misery, but then let's figure out the things that you do that help you to thrive. And the best way to, to hold off a depression is to build emotional, mental strength in well-being. And so he, he calls that positive uh, psychology. Jesus didn't say that he came to resolve misery, to take misery away. Jesus said he came so that we could have an abundant life. It is fascinating to me that the, the same things that psychologists recognize, if, if you do these things, it will help you flourish. There are also things that God has been telling us to do so we can have an abundant life. So examples of things that would be our part of a partnership uh, that we would do emotionally to push back against depression. Three blessings, the exercise of three blessings. You keep a little journal by your bed. And at the end of the day, as you're going to bed, you write down three blessings, three good things that happened to you that day. And it just helps raise our awareness to recognize them. And we get better at seeing that they're always happening when otherwise we might miss them. Uh, random acts of kindness. Uh, doing something nice for someone helps us feel good. And it might even make it stronger if it's a stranger, someone you don't know. It might make it stronger if it's someone who can't possibly repay you. And doing those kindnesses, it helps our spirit. And uh, gratitude. Uh, Seligman says that think of someone who's uh, sewn into your life, done something good, and then write them a letter 
And then call them up and take them to coffee or lunch or whatever and read the letter and express that. Well, God has uh, long been telling us to give thanks uh, for he is good. And so these kind of things, when we do them, they help us flourish, they help us have an abundant life. And that is like a strong offense is the best defense against depression. So those are things we can do in our emotional area. Let's talk about the relational component of humanity. What would our part of a partnership be regarding the relational? Uh, one thing is we might have to reconcile some of our relationships that we have. If there are breaks in the relationship, we might have to go work those out by uh, asking for and granting forgiveness, which is, is hard to do. But if we don't, if we harbor unforgiveness, it can turn into bitterness, and bitterness very much feeds depression. Uh, we might have to set boundaries and limits on some people in our lives that do hurtful things. And this is especially for those people you can't avoid. Like if they're just in your family, your blood family, you're going to see them at family gatherings, at, at holidays and things. But they do hurtful things. You might have to learn how to do boundaries and limits with consequences to limit your exposure to those hurtful things. And it's so important and something that hardly anyone knows to do from birth. It's one of the classes that we teach, and that's why we teach that. Um, additionally, you might have to swap some friends, swap out some bad ones for some better ones. You might have to fire some friends or at least demote them from your inner circle to you know, those uh, a little bit uh, further out from you, less access to your heart, less trusted because uh, you need friends that are going to sow good things into you. You need friends that are going to be able to give to you as well as take from you. You need friends who are willing to be vulnerable to you as well as be safe people for you to be vulnerable with. And basically, you need people who are mutual, where it evenly goes back and forth. Uh, and in order to have those kind of relationships, you might find that you have to improve your relational skills. And so we teach things like listening and speaking the truth in love because hardly any of us were born knowing how to do that. And it's so critical to tending to our relational aspects, which will help us have strength to fight and resist depression. Then the physical, and with the physical, um, like it's obvious most people know what we need to do to take care of ourselves physically. We need to eat right. We need to get enough sleep. We need to do some exercise. So it's not a problem of knowing what to do. It's just that if you're feeling depressed feelings, those things seem awfully hard to do. And if you're in a depression, they just seem impossible. There's no way you can do that. It just seems overwhelming to think about. Uh, the secret in that case is we're looking for a little success, a little beginning that you build on. And then you, like a snowball, you gradually grow it. And the, the very first small thing if you're feeling so overwhelmed in this matter, might be to go talk to a doctor to see about a medicine. Uh, most cases, medicine does not cure the depression, but medicine buys us a margin where we have strength uh, to do some of these other things. Uh, the depression lifts enough that I can start to think about preparing healthy meals. Uh, the depression lifts enough that I could think about doing a little bit of a walk, a little bit of an exercise. Uh, that I can maybe start to feel better and my mind will rest and I can go to sleep and get the rest I need. So those are the, the physical things. Now, uh, talking about the spiritual, what our part in the partnership when it comes to the spiritual. If you've, if you've ever felt depressed feelings or you felt like you've been in a depression, think about that. Did it, didn't it seem like, like there was sort of a darkness hovering over you, maybe even pressing in on you? Uh, an oppressive kind of darkness, I don't think that's imagined. Uh, one of my favorite sayings is, it's not paranoia if someone really is out to get you. And I think uh, the battle of light and darkness, that's real. And you think about it, it only makes sense strategically for Satan, who we know is a, uh, a creature of limited abilities, but he set himself at war with infinite God. So strategically, it's to his advantage to find a naturally occurring hardship and then pile onto it rather than trying to create a difficulty everywhere he goes. So uh, a worldwide pandemic, uh, stress in the culture, political unrest, those are things that are naturally happening. It would make sense that the enemy might press in upon us in those times. So uh, what do we do? What could our partnership be about things such as that? 
Well, we get a very helpful insight from Scripture from James chapter 4. Uh, James writes this. He says, He, God, gives us more grace. That is why Scripture says God opposes the proud but gives uh, favor to the humble. Submit yourselves then to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Come near to God, and he will come near to you. So when it comes to the spiritual thing, you don't have to think uh, always about exorcism or deliverance. It it's, maybe starts with things as simple as resist the devil, which is resist the temptation to self-comfort. Uh, the party we're all familiar with, the pity party. It's tempting, but maybe resist that. Resist the urge to self-medicate. Uh, self-medicating is usually the pathway towards an addiction, and addictions are horribly powerful. And if we're already doing badly, we don't want to invite uh, that kind of trouble on top of it. Uh, resist the urge towards distraction. And these are things that could be innocent enough uh, in and of themselves, watching TV, work, hobbies. But if your friends start to say, wow, you spend a lot of time, a lot of money on that hobby, that uh, activity, a lot of time watching TV, that might be a clue that maybe we're using that as a distraction from things that are hard that we don't want to look at. But the problem is we can't be collaborators with our tormentor and expect to feel Expect to feel better. So we got to resist Satan, and the promise is he will begin to flee. And we got to draw near to God. Now, obviously, we, you, know, you would think, well, I need to get myself out of the house and go to church on the weekend and be there with the brothers and the sisters, and we do corporate worship, we hear God's word. Yes, yes, certainly that. That's the beginning. But more than that, because depression doesn't stop after Sunday, it's, you know, it's still there Monday through Saturday. So we got to find out what are the other things. And it can be different for, for different people. Uh, for some folks, it might be a walk in nature is how they experience and draw near to God. It could be listening to or singing worship songs. It could be studying or memorizing scripture. It could be serving someone. It could be journaling. And in journaling, uh, make that journaling your prayers, the things you tell God, sharing your thoughts and feelings and ideas and, and asking him for input. And even just conversation with people, especially if it's people who also know God and are trying to pursue him. Uh, Jesus made the promise if two or three gather in his name, he would be in the midst. So for some of us, we might recognize that when we come together with folks, we feel God. Uh, and we're drawing near to him and he's drawing near to us. So those kind of things in the spiritual realm become our partnership. So you see each of those areas, there's a little something that we could do. Uh, and and I, I need to make this confession. Those, if you start to f think about it very much, you go, and that's going to solve depression, I honestly don't know anything that we can do that makes all the bad things good things, all the sad, hard things happy things. Uh, I don't think that's what we're looking for. What we're looking for is something that makes us more resilient in the face of hard things so we don't give up. We're looking for something that redeems some good things out of hard things. And we're looking for something that sustains us until the circumstances improve, uh, factoring in that we, we don't know where that's going to be. And so that's what our part of the partnership does. It doesn't make everything all better, but it helps us push in. It gives us space for God to send his power. And little by little, step by step, it gives us a hope of things improving. Um, so in review, could we quarantine ourselves into a depression? Yes. Absolutely, quarantine pushes us that way. Uh, what's the difference between having depressed feelings and being depressed or being in a depression? Uh, it's a matter of intensity and how long it lasts, duration, and maybe how much effort is going to be needed to put into it before you start to uh, see results. What's the difference in responding to each one, feelings uh, of depression or being depressed? Really, the, it's very little difference. It's the same kind of things, the same kind of healthy practices. The difference, again, just maybe how long it's going to take for that to begin to work. And uh, maybe just the difference of expecting, adjusting our expectations to, from there's something out there somewhere. If I can just learn it, it's going to make this all better. To uh, there are things that I can do that are going to make this survivable and give me a chance of having something, uh, a treasure on the other side. But that's, that's what we change our mind to. Um, I find myself lately uh, coming back to a, a, a prayer, a familiar prayer. And I've talked about it a couple different places. But it's because 
it seems relevant as I think about various different things. And so I've been praying it a lot, uh, and that's the serenity prayer. And so as I wrap up, uh, I'll pray that and invite you uh, to join me in praying. Father, would you grant us the serenity to accept the things we can't change? Would you give us the courage to change the things that we can? And would you give us uh, the wisdom to know the difference? And as we're living one day at a time, enjoying one moment at a time, enduring hardship as a pathway to peace, and taking, as Jesus did, the sinful world as it is, not as I would have it. Trusting that you will make all things right if we surrender to your will so that we could be reasonably happy in this life and supremely happy with you forever in the next. Amen.